everyone, it's Alex, and today I'm here to do my April wrap-up. I think April for me was definitely a month that was the best in sequencing what I read and how all of the books I read kind of talked to each other. And really quickly, I want to mention Second Place by Rachel Cusk, which comes out... I think next week. If you're starting out with Rachel Cusk, I would actually start here. And I did a full review of this on my channel already, but between this and the Outline Trilogy, it was refreshing in its own way, with Cusk at least having some sort of tethering to the world with using a plot this time, or at least a much more structured plot. And basically the book is about this woman named M who invites an artist that she admires and his name is L, and she invites him to live with her family like doing a residency so he can work on his art. The story is shrouded in this kind of mystery since M is talking about all of this from the perspective of it being about the past as she's talking to someone named Jeffers in real time about all of the things that happened. I think this smartly sort of angles the narrative to allow M to feel at ease with sort of looking back on her developments between what she thinks about motherhood, art, and life. So again, I really enjoyed this one and I'm really curious if this will maybe garner some more Cusk fans because I think it is a bit more inviting versus the Outline Trilogy. Up next I have Days of Distraction by Alexandra Chang, which follows a 20-something who's Chinese-American, also named Alexandra. Alexandra is in this flux both personally with like romantic stuff, but also professionally with overall fatigue with her work life. Alexandra is working in tech and then later she ends up moving with her boyfriend to a more remote part of New York than what she's used to so he can pursue grad school. I would assume that this book is very autobiographical just because Alexandra Chang shares a lot of similarities in her background that she developed for the character Alexandra, both working in tech or like at least tech writing and then also her having to move to Ithaca, New York. So kicking off this kind of awakening to a consciousness of Alexandra the character, kind of realizing her positioning within a systematic place like work, she really begins to like think about how her race is implemented, not only within that being its own product of perception, but also her being a woman as well. This growing sense of skepticism really plays into what was most interesting for me, how Alexandra is looking, what I thought, for a model of how she's meant to be both American, a woman, a partner, and a good worker, all within the structure or the concept of how her parents also immigrated to the States, but also how her parents are divorced and they seem to be much more different people than maybe what she's expected. And with the concept of relationships especially, especially whenever you're thinking of her parents, it feels more like an asset or love as an asset to being a condiment to one's relationship versus being the centerpiece. Culminating in Alexandra's conflict being this sense of her own accountability for what it means to try to position herself in all of her desires of what she really wants to overcome, whether that be certain malaise towards work or how she feels really trapped within an interracial relationship where her partner is white and then talking about the privileges that he has. And all of this is fine, but I really didn't feel like this book went beyond the surface level introductions of these concepts. Like I thought maybe Alexandra would have more thoughts on work leading to something like anti-capitalism or maybe if it's about her romantic partner, kind of maybe having this sense of surveillance of maybe what it means to be in an interracial relationship for anyone that isn't still passing as heteronormative or anything like that. So the story really plateaus for me because I feel like it's trying to struggle with creating this volley between really valid like concerns of her positioning in the world, but it all just didn't really feel like it was vocalizing much beyond, again, all that surface level stuff. Particularly how any sense of stakes with this story kind of feel more apathetic just because the narrative relies so much on Alexandra's voice kind of sticking to symbolism, which to me maybe accidentally gave this more passive sort of reflection of who Alexandra is versus her feeling like she's really trying to take the steps to be the type of person she wants to be with all of these progressive thoughts. So Days of Distraction was interesting and I liked what it was trying to do, but I just feel like its execution was a little poor. Meanwhile, with the next book I want to talk about, I absolutely loved and I think did way better at vocalizing a sense of voice and being 
really confident in what it had to say, even though if it didn't mean that what it was saying had to be right, and that is Detransition Baby by Tori Peters. This story follows three characters that are harmoniously brought together to really consider the process of pregnancy. We have Reese, who is a trans woman, and we also have Ames, who detransitioned while previously known as Amy. And finally, we have Katrina, who is a cis woman, and Tori Peters herself is a trans woman. So with all the discussion of everything going on in this book, I think Tori Peters did an amazing job at navigating the... Because, uh, like, what I feel like with books like this, it's so easy to go wrong where it feels like it's a giant info dump, but she really knows how to play it into the initial plot of how both... Ames, Reese, and Katrina want to sort of unify and think about the prospect of this pregnancy. So immediately with pregnancy, I might think of thematically what it means to be like a parent or a mother or even the idea of this future child in general. And Peters really treats this book as a social construction of politics between all of these ideas and it's really enhanced by choosing to do the third person perspective. Allowing readers to really get a feel of both or really all characters, all three of them, their own anxieties and insecurities without it feeling like a competition while still emphasizing this sense of intimacy by really making it feel that each character had their own set expectations of their own predictive measures of what it means to be a successful parent in their own way. Because I think between things like desire or sex or yearning and what it means with establishing those things in the parameters of parenthood, I feel like it's really indulgent of not really trying to sort of discover also those more invisible connections of like the literal coordination of what it means to become a parent and how all those things feel very logistical and how they're things that you need open communication about. And for me, the big great part about this book is through Katrina, Reese, and Ames, we really get into these vignettes of how we can maybe see their like minds at work of really reliving their memories and how they serve for identifying spaces and especially what that means for anyone in the trans community or whatever else involving things like your sexuality or how you identify as a person in general. The really great parts I think of that were written really well and very vivid with things involved like what it means to go somewhere like an adult store or a sex store or even also equating that experience to something like the immediacy of violence by getting into a fight on a sidewalk and having spectators. And while these moments are certainly vulnerable, Peters doesn't use it as a way to access or gatekeep anything about sympathy. And Peters kind of makes fun of this by articulating, in some instances, the trans experience of people possibly being things like trying to show sympathy by donating to someone's GoFundMe. And it's funny because it sounds like while getting to know Reese that this is definitely something she would say. So it's not even a matter to serve as a contrast to the trans experience or trying to define what that is because we also have aims. But aims is not meant to be a measure or a binary of how one can live their life or pursue their identity. And while I really liked Ames' story too, I think the real star of this book for me is Reese, mainly because of her progression with trying to navigate her idolization of motherhood. And Peters doesn't make it easy by trying to situate Reese as a, her quest for motherhood only on the basis of trying to succeed at her identity, like in her own way of trying to understand what that means of being a trans woman. And Peters really makes you work, or I felt like I was really working for understanding the mental mechanisms behind how Reese thought, and that's always the reward for me. And seeing how Reese is not meant to be the example or a model that we should idolize ourselves. To me, Detransition Baby is so successful because it always tries to remind us about the human error of experience and how we 
so strongly desire to be understood, even if it means like repeatedly our ways of trying to be understood isn't always the best way. So I really loved this book and I hope more people read it and I hope they like it too. Up next I wanted to talk about Parakeet by Marie Helene Bertino. This novel opens by following a woman who's preparing for her wedding day over a course of a few days. Strangely she's also being haunted by this parakeet that she swears is her dead grandmother. From there the story opens with a gateway of really blending the surreal and really depicting what the difference is between reality and fiction. And at times a sense of detail really throws you for a loop with a sense of disorientation. For me causing this recurring sort of reminder at what it like these instances of pause and readjusting oneself to really have time to think in general as the parakeet opens by literally saying what is the internet and having very encompassing questions like that to really make you understand just how subjective your perception of sort of subjects like that can be. And as the narrator thinks about that question, it really puts her through like some mental gymnastics of really feeling what it means to feel the pressure of one's memory and how there is this instinctive quality to memory that leaves us really accountable for how we feel about the people around us. Like in this case for the narrator, how she feels about her own doubts with her upcoming marriage and what it means to be a daughter and also a sister. And it's through her attempt at understanding through that that she has like these many, I would say, many disassociative episodes to where it's more inviting for the surreal to occur. Using the surreal as a narrative device that I think was really well done at creating these light bulbs for the narrator to kind of feel like she's becoming more dependent on it. Even if through the implied fiction of one's dead grandmother being through a parakeet. Because in real life, with the contrast of that, we do have real instances, for example, of how the narrator watches a play that's meant to be a simulacra of her life and then she's also during her wedding day there's someone literally having their wedding in the next room so she has plenty of examples of where she's able to realize that her real life is trying to speak for her in ways that she can have these sort of relationships between not having to always rely on the surreal. Really playing at, at whether or not symbolism is the most credible through our imagination or if we are able to convince ourselves to rely on perceiving real life as it is, which is terrifying. So again, I think Bertino does a great job at really managing this sense of writing through the very strong sense of her voice. But unfortunately, sometimes I think Bertino has too much of this immediacy of moving on to the next conversation or the next thing to ruminate about. Kind of like a balloon slowly like deflating, like bopping at the ceiling and just slowly like being pulled down, which I, that's a weird like image probably. Another criticism I have is that sometimes the situations within this book do feel a bit formulaic to where the narrator's interacting with someone, there's a surreal moment, and then the chapter ends with a bit of reflection. So while I think the compact timeline of a few days leading up to a wedding I think is good, I think it's showing its disadvantages by the story feeling like it's repeating these beats as a way to move forward in finishing the plot that it already tried to establish in the beginning. While this book certainly has a breakthrough of tenderness that I really enjoyed reading about, I can't help but put it in the back of my mind that this isn't the book's fault, it's my own, because I feel like this book does fall into the category of the young 20-something or whatever else that's feeling like this existential malaise, which I was in the mood for to read whenever I read this, but in the back of my mind, I feel like Parakeet just isn't a book that will really stay with me. With my reading choices is something I'm trying to be more conscious of. Of uh, Sure, Parakeet was a comfort read for me, but I want it to be something that will really impress me for a really long time, which unfortunately this just sort of got lost in the shuffle of all the other books that it kind of reminds me of. And unfortunately in that similar vein of books that I feel like just won't really stay with me after is Tokyo Ueno Station by Yu Marie translated by Morgan Giles. This story follows the ghost of a man named Kazu as he's leading us into these different reflections about his life. Part of that is this really grim look at how he lost his wife and also his son and it really leaves him amiss and adrift into eventually being homeless. And amidst all of this we do get connections to how Kazu is feeling like he's searching for glimmers of life within how life is trying to feel 
serendipitous to maybe articulating a sense of fate, such as Kazu-san sharing the same birthday as a leadership figure in Japan, and also how him and his wife go visit their friend and their child looks a lot like their deceased son. This book is really melancholic, which I wasn't expecting, but it doesn't entirely try to flex its gloom. But somehow, and I don't know why, but this book just really did not click for me and it was really hard to find it compelling most of the time. The writing is pretty plain and while I appreciated like the overall story itself, it felt like Marie was trying to lead into these other sort of dimensions of thought, which might have been a narrative choice with Kazu maybe trying to compete sort of this reflection on his overall life as a ghost, which I guess him being a ghost was a way to have that make sense. But then the book is also trying to talk about things like homelessness and homelessness violence, which is fine, but I don't know, it just all left a really foggy impression on me. It's like going to a restaurant, but you only eat appetizers and you're not allowed to have the full menu. And I think this is the first time I've made a food analogy on my channel. I don't know, the more I dwell on it, like, I don't know, am I gaslighting my own thoughts about this book? Because it's, like for me, sometimes when a book makes me feel neutral, sometimes that's worse than a book making me feel negative about it because it, then at least I know my reaction to it and knowing I actively disliked it. But for Tokyo Ueno Station, I don't know. It's, I definitely won't, like it won't be like a very memorable reading experience for me because I don't know, I don't really know what to really make much of what I read other than it just being fine. It was just there. And that's pretty much my thoughts on it. So those are all my thoughts about all the books I read in April. So if you read any of these books, I would really like to know what you think. And we are, well, I'm trying. This might be a new backdrop for my videos. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.